Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our iDIG Bio webinar, Insights into InSelect, automating image processing, barcode reading, and validation of user-defined data. Um, I'm Deb Paul, uh, and we're here with Talia Karim, and I'd like to introduce our guests from the Natural History Museum in London, software developers, and our presenters today, Ben Price and Lawrence Hudson. Hello. Hello. Today they'll be talking to us about InSelect, it's an open source application for Mac and Windows for using images to, uh, to capture specimen data. We'll get an overview of the software and how it can be integrated into in existing workflows, and then we'll actually see a demo of the software. Uh, then the eager, well, they're eager to get to the part that's a discussion to get your input for uh, new ideas for development and future um, features and applications for InSelect. It's under active development, uh, and, and so they're very, very eager to get uh, your thoughts. So please take notes while we're talking because we will turn your participant microphones on at the end. Before we get started, just a tiny bit of housekeeping, you can type in the chat anytime during the webinar. Uh, we'll turn the microphones on at the end of the demo. We have a really short survey uh, where we try to get your input. So please, sometime before you leave the meeting today, um, there. And that also helps keep us an, an added bonus. Uh, it helps keep us from having to institute webinar registration. And now we're ready for Ben. Take it away. Brilliant. Thanks, Deb. Can you hear me OK? Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, well, thanks to Deb for inviting us and for hosting this webinar. And thank you all for joining us today. We're both really excited to show you Insect and to get your feedback on, as Deb said, on additional features that you think would be useful in your collections. Uh, just as a, a background, a brief introduction, I'm a curator at the Natural History Museum. I'm responsible for the small orders insect collection, which is essentially all the flies that aren't flies or butterflies. So I look after all the dragonflies, the caddisflies, the mayflies, and so on. I've been involved with this project uh, from the outset, as I'm really interested with in mobilizing data from our collections. But not only that, but in the most useful and efficient way possible. Uh, Lawrence, who will be leading on the um, live demo in a few minutes, uh, he's a software engineer turned ecologist. Uh, he's now working as a developer in the Natural History Museum's informatics group. And he's interested in increasing the sort of automation in all areas of digitization. He'll be doing the live demo in a few minutes after I give a, a bit of background info. So we're going to turn off, or I'm going to turn off my webcam at the moment to save some bandwidth, and then we'll get on with the rest of the show. Okay, so we would like to start with some acknowledgements. Um, this project involved quite a few people, um, some of whom are listed here. The initial prototype and the current segmentation algorithms that we're using in InSelect were developed um, by our collaborators Peter and Stefan from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And they were, they were given input um, and sort of direction from Lawrence Livermore, Vlad Blagodorov, and Vince Smith here from the Natural History Museum. Then the initial app was developed by Alice Heaton, who's a developer here at the museum. And over the last year, we've been using InSelect, a pilot mass digitization project of about 100,000 microscope slides, uh, which has involved 40 volunteer users providing really valuable feedback. But in addition to that, the majority of user feedback has come from sort of three primary users, uh, Louise, Natalie, and myself, which is why we're sort of very interested in getting the additional features you think would be useful in your collection. The development was su supported from funding from Synthesis and the National Environment Research Council. So just as a bit of very brief history, the museum opened to the public in 1759 as part of the British Museum. With our collections moving to the present site in South Kensington, which you can see here, opening to the public in 1881. Our collections are vast and varied. Uh, they're estimated to comprise about 80 million objects, including 1.2 million specimens. And only a tiny fraction of these collections are on display to the public. Only 4% of our collection is specimen level data based and currently accessible online. And we're in the process of changing this with the rather ambitious goal of making all of the collection accessible online in the most efficient way possible. So the single largest collection in the museum is the Pinned Insect Collection, examples of which you can see here. It's estimated that we have approximately 
at 30 to 35 million specimens, which is around 40% of our entire collection as pinned insects. These specimens are housed in approximately 130,000 drawers. And in the insect collection specific, we only have 2.5% of, of this collection database at the specimen level. With the majority of those records being created by the iCollections project, which I'll speak about in a few minutes, which is over the last three years. So I just briefly wanted to sort of touch on digitization itself. What is digitization? As a community, we're often discussing digitization and how to make digitization efficient, but what is, what is it we're actually talking about? There are a lot of different activities that are involved in turning information from the physical specimens into digital data, each with different benefits and associated costs implications. This diagram, I must point out, isn't actually based on any data. Uh, but is more of a conceptual representation of the proportion of specimens that can be digitized per unit effort. So on the x-axis today we have specimens per unit effort, the larger the bar, the more specimens per unit effort. For example, at the, the lower end of the scale here, the information scale, we have digitization as creating stubbed specimen level records in a database with minimal information limited to the unique identifier or catalog number, the current identification and the location in the collection. And this is a sort of very broad and thin approach to digitization, but it gives users an overview of the collection, enables more rapid and potentially automated image and data input at a later stage as required. At the higher end of the scale, there's the fully transcribed, fully georeferenced specimen record, but there are huge cost implications in terms of time, but also huge <coughs> benefits from liberating this amount of data. And I suppose the balance between the, these ends of the spectra depends on who you are. So, for example, a curator would find stub records um, quite useful for collections management purposes. An ecologist may prioritize georeferenced locality data. However, a taxonomist may prioritize diagnostic images of all the type of specimens we have in the collection. This is something we have to think about when we try and tackle digitization as a museum. So, our museums just concluded over the last sort of three years this has been running the iCollections program and this has been concluded um, this month. It was a pilot project into the digitization of pin insects using the georeference specimen record as the digitization goal. Uh, so the iCollections project sets up a sort of gold standard approach for future digitization of our insect collections. It managed to digitize over 600,000 specimens of British and Irish butterflies and moths over a three-year period as I said. And this was at a total cost, if you include all the staff time, of just under two pounds per specimen. And while this is undoubtedly the end goal for our entire pinned collection, insect collection, if we were to use this approach, it would take about 800 person years and cost almost 60 million pounds to achieve this level of digitization. So by targeting the lower end of the information scale, we can speed up the creation of the specimen records, albeit with reduced information, but allowing prioritization of future more detailed digitization activities as is when these are required in the collections. So when creating this basic specimen record with a simple image, it's a lot easier and quicker to image 130,000 insect drawers than it is to image 33 million individual insects. So at the museum, we've got the SAT scan instrument, which you can see here. It can scan 70 drawers per day at quite a high resolution. However, for well, this goal of creating simple stub <clears throat> records with a basic image, a simple digital camera can be used to produce dorsal images um, of large groups of specimens, and we're currently investigating alternative foster methods for whole draw imaging at high resolution. The main problem with this approach traditionally is that the static draw images aren't actually very useful because specimen, as specimens are moved around the collection, the link between the draw image and the actual reality, the data degrades, and delivering high resolution image draw images takes quite a bit of bandwidth. Manually cropping out 33 million individual insects will probably take too much time, and without unique identifiers on these individual records, they're sort of a questionable value. So as a result, we've turned to computer vision algorithms to help us segment each insect out of the draw and combine this with bulk metadata annotation and automated processes to streamline the creation of useful specimen records from these whole draw images. So this is an example of a draw being processed in InSelect. 
Uh, the goal when developing InSelect, as I mentioned, was to solve some of these problems associated with whole draw imaging. So we wanted it to identify individual specimens, crop out specimen level images, capture metadata such as catalog numbers, the location within the collection, possibly information on labels, for example, with slides where they are two dimensional, and then associate all of this metadata with the relevant cropped images in the most sort of streamlined and automated way possible. Just as a brief orientation before Lawrence takes over for the live demo, there are three major sections to inselect. The first is the whole draw image in the main window that you can see there, where the segmentation and refining of, this, of the images, individual segmented images, takes place. The top is the plugin selection, and on the right you can see the metadata capture panel. In inselect, we've got two views available in the program. Uh, this is the boxes view that you're looking at now, which shows the overall image and can be used for bulk metadata annotation. And then this is the objects view, which shows each segmented object from a larger image. And this view is particularly useful for adding additional metadata for or for label transcription, as you can deal, easily deal with one image at a time. So that's a, a very brief background of the development of InSelect. I'm going to hand over to Lawrence, who's over some live images in the most sort of streamlined and automated way possible. Just as a brief orientation before. Great. Thanks very much, Ben. And thanks very much to Deb and for IDIG by for hosting us. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you happen to be, I'd recognize at least one name from Australia, where I believe it's 2 AM. So that's, that's some real dedication, either that or someone needs to watch a, a software demo in order to be able to get to sleep. Um, so as Ben said, we'll just run through a few worked examples to show InSelect in all its glory. And the first one of these is an insect soup, courtesy of, of Sarah in Australia. This one of, of uh, true flies or diptera. So I'm taking a, a TIFF there of just under 300 megabytes in size. I've dragged it into InSelect window. Um, and InSelect has done a couple of things for us. Firstly, it's created uh, a .inselect file, which is just a lightweight text file where we're going to store the location of the bounding boxes um, and associated metadata. It's also created a JPEG thumbnail. As you can probably see, that's much, much smaller than the TIFF. Sometimes we're dealing with TIFFs of several hundred megabytes in size. They can take sort of 10, 20, 30 seconds to read. So having a JPEG that's very, very fast to read and very lightweight to process um, is an advantage. So the TIFF is only read by insect when absolutely necessary, for example, when saving crops or when reading barcodes. So we're going to set ourselves the task of placing a bounding box around each one of these lovely flies and then uh, exporting each crop to its own JPEG. So to start off with just some basic image handling, I can hold down the control button um, and on a, on a mouse wheel I can wheel up and down or on a Mac I can swipe up and down with two fingers to zoom in and to zoom out, fairly basic stuff. We've got zoom in and zoom out buttons here. And I can pan around on my, on my Mac trackpad, again, using two fingers. Um, incidentally, whenever I say control during this demo, you should use the command button on a Mac, that stupid box with the funny ears that Apple have invented. Um, if you're using a Mac, you, you, you're used to that anyway, I think. So to create bounding boxes, I can do a right click, drag. There we have a box. I can grab hold of it. I can resize it to fit around the insect. I can create a couple more. I can press Z for Zulu to zoom into one of the boxes that's selected. I can resize it using the handles. I can resize it using the keyboard. So if I hold down the shift button and press down and up, I move the bottom edge. Left and right moves the right hand edge. Similarly, if I hold down the Alt button, I move the top left. And if I'm holding down no button at all and just use the arrow keys, then I can move the box around. So we could draw all our boxes manually, but that would be very silly and a complete waste of our time. So as Ben mentioned, we've been using and applying computer vision techniques in order to get the machines to do the hard work for us. So at the top here on the toolbar, there's a segment image button. This is operating on the thumbnail. This doesn't require the full resolution TIFF to be loaded. In that case, it was very quick. With more complex images, it can sometimes take sort of 20 or 30 seconds in order to segment. And as you can see, it's done a reasonable job of placing a bounding box around each of our, each of our flies. It's also 
place bounding boxes around this text. So I will drag the mouse around this text and I can use the delete button on the keyboard to remove those. I'll click on one of these almost at random. Again, Z for Zulu to zoom in. I can now do Control N for November to go to the next box. Control P for previous to go to the previous box. And using these, these buttons, it's very, very quick to just whiz through all my bounding boxes and make sure that they look OK. So here we have an example where the wings are overlapping and Inselect has not been able to disentangle these two individuals, so it's placed a single box around the two flies. So I could, at this point, resize the box to just fit around one and then draw another one. But I won't do that because, again, that's a bit time consuming and laborious. If I hold down the Shift button, I can click on each of our individual insects and at the top there's a sub-segment box button. Um, what we've done to inselect is we've indicated where the, the centers of interest are of these two objects, and the sub-segment sub button will now attempt to place a bounding box around each of those individuals. And it's done, again, again, a reasonable job. It's probably asking too much to get it spot on because of the overlapping wings. So I can resize those boxes to encompass the individuals. And then, as before, control N to keep going through the rest of my image. So I'll just hit Z now to zoom back out. I won't go through the whole image. As you can see, it's done a reasonably good job. There's, there are a few more instances where we've got things running together, but I won't fix all of those now. Up at the file menu here, we have a command that says save crops. So as you might imagine, this is now going to save each one of those boxes to its own file. Pretty quick. I can go back to my TIFF file, and at the top there's a directory that's been created, and as you might expect, here we have all of our cropped out bounding boxes. So it's pretty quick to go from a, a big TIFF with lots of individuals through to individual images with which you can work, individual files. So let's look at another example, and for this one we're going to look at um, some metadata templates. So we'll close this one. Drag in our TIFF. As before, it says it's creating the thumbnail for us, and it creates the .inselect file. So here we have some moths. I will segment my image. This one's a little more complex, so it takes a bit longer to find all of the individuals. And as before, we, we get norm, pretty good behavior. Most of the moths have just a, one box encompassing them. At the top right here, you can see it's detected some of the, of the, the wooden frame of the tray as being of interest, so I can delete these, see the extra ones. Um, likewise, at the top left and at the bottom here. As before, I can shift click and then do a sub-segment in order to tidy up all those cases where one box contains more than one individual. Again, I won't go through all of those to get them exactly right, but it's quite a simple task to do that. So on the right here, as Ben said, we've got um, a, a, a panel for metadata. So this is showing simple Darwin core terms, um, which I guess are of limited use, but it's a sensible default, I think, in, in lieu of anything else. Um, you have complete control over what fields appear on the right here and any associated validation. So what I'll do now is I'll just show what a metadata template looks like. Um, I won't go through the, the details of this, but it's, it's a fairly straightforward task to take an existing template and modify it for your own ends. So name of the template is, is self-explanatory. This is the, the family of moss that we're dealing with. But at the bottom here, we've got a section called fields. So location is mandatory. So the user has to answer that question. We're going to give you a choice of four different draws for location. Similarly, for taxonomy, that's mandatory. And here we have a list of, of uh, genera in this family that are of interest in this, uh, in this exercise. So I will go back to inselect. I just click on here where it says simple Darwin core terms. And I've got the option here to choose a different template. 
Okay, so now we see boxes with our two fields, location and taxonomy, and each of the bounding boxes has now turned this really rather awful shade of pink. And this tells us at a glance that all of these boxes have some kind of problem with the validation of their metadata. In this case, we said that both location and taxonomy are mandatory fields, and none of these boxes have that information yet. So if I click on the first one, I can say, right, well, location, we're in draw one, taxonomy, we're down the bottom here. Once both questions are answered, the fields have gone white, and the bounding box over here has gone clear. So let's say for the sake of argument, I make a mistake on my second box and I select draw two, but the correct genus. If I drag the mouse over those two boxes, we've only got one answer for genus, that's the correct one, but for location we had two. So as is familiar from software such as iTunes and the like, if you have a m multiple metadata values, we see a star to indicate that there's, there's a conflict there. I can do a select all operation off the edit menu here. All my boxes are selected. In this case, everything's draw one and everything's the same genus. So when we're dealing with batches of uh, individuals for which all, all this metadata is, is common, it's a, then a pretty straightforward task just to tag everything in one go. So let's go back to the template. And there was a line here that I didn't explain. This is called object label. And what we're saying here is that these objects are going to be named by the value of their taxonomy, and then a hyphen, the value of the location, a hyphen, and then item number, where that's, that's an arbitrary number that in, in select assigns to that bounding box. So if I go File, Save Crops, as before, the crops are cropped out of the, the full resolution TIFF. And as before, we've got a directory created with all of our crops in. And I hope that uh, text is big enough to, to be legible there. We've got the genus name, a hyphen, draw one, a hyphen, and then numbers one, two, three, four, all the way down to 49, which is the number of bounding boxes. So that we found to be a really, really useful mechanism because this means you don't have to come to a software developer and say, well, Lawrence, I want fields X, Y, and Z with, with all these uh, complex validation rules. You can pretty much set it up for yourself. So Ben has done a lot of these just by modifying existing templates. Um, and then we've got some documentation online as to how you can build these up for yourselves. You can also export metadata to a CSV file. So in more complex cases where the file names will get too long if you're capturing uh, several tens of fields, So once I run that operation, we have alongside the TIFF and the .inselect file a .csv file. I'll open that one up. So the first column is always cropped image name, uh, pretty self-explanatory item number, and there are the values of our two metadata fields that we defined. And again, any fields that you define in the template will appear in the CSV file. Okay, let's move on. The next example is one of uh, Microscope Slides. Uh, ben mentioned that we've had a large pilot project running, and, and this is it. We've used InSelect to process, I think, getting on for 100,000 of these slides. Um, initially, we were dealing with, um, I think, 72 slides on a template. We now have, in this one, 100. So up to 100 slides. They're not all slides. Some of these are markers where you can see the red labels there. They're little markers just saying to the operator, everything from, from then on, in that row belongs to a particular draw. So I'll go through that one in a bit more detail. As before, we segment. And I know for a fact that there are 100 sockets in this template. At the top here, InSelect is telling me it's found 102 boxes. And the extra naughty ones are right here at the top left. There's a little sticky label. So we'll get rid of him, and again at the top right, a little sticky label. I'm not sure what those are telling us, but um, they do get in the way a bit of segmentation. And I will choose a different metadata template because we're on a different project here. 
So as before, location and taxonomy, and we also have a field here called catalog number. So let's have a look at this template and find out what's going on there. Put that one, I'll hit over here. Um, so as with the MOF template, we're providing, or we're asking for, location and a list of options and taxonomy. So where you don't know the species, you just put the genus in and we've got the, all, the list of all the species that we're interested in at this point. And the object label, as before, is taxonomy and location, and then catalog number. Catalog number here, this is actually a Darwin Core field, so we've got a link to the definition on a Darwin Core site. As with the other fields, it's mandatory, and we've also got this thing here. This is horrible techno babble, a regular expression that says, this field must be exactly nine digits nothing else. So let's see that in action. I'll click on my first box and I'm going to arbitrarily assign a taxonomy and location to it. So I can just start typing away. As soon as I hit nine numbers, the box goes clear, the field goes white, telling me that everything's okay. If I add in a space at the end, it goes red. If it's anything other than nine digits, so if I put a letter in there, it stays red. So this is a very, very powerful mechanism to ensure that data are entered correctly. Um, and in this case, barcodes are read correctly. So what I'm going to do is zoom in on, on one of these. Um, in fact, what I'll do first is just clear this horrible pink so we can see the, the thing in more detail. Each one of these slides has quite a bit of label information. And as I said, we've got a, a data matrix barcode on each one. This is quite a challenge for a barcode reader. These, these barcodes make up about 1% of the area of that image. It's, it, we're asking a lot for a barcode reader to find and correctly decode that data matrix barcode. Um, when the, the readers don't operate on the, on the thumbnail image, they operate on the full resolution scan, but even so, it's asking quite a lot. Under the edit menu, right down at the bottom, you have the option to configure the read barcodes function. So we'll have a look at that one. And we provide three options. The first one is if you're using data matrix barcodes, there's a, a built-in open source library for doing that. The second option is if you're using one-dimensional codes or QR codes, there's a, a slightly different open source library to do that. Both of these libraries are, are, are kind of okay. They, they don't do a bad job. We found during the slides pilot that there were, in some cases, too many barcodes that, that they don't read. They're also quite slow, um, certainly in comparison to the last option, which is a commercial like a commercial uh, barcode reading library provided by InLight Research. We did quite a bit of investigation into about, I think it was 10 different readers, and this one was the, the, the clear winner. Uh, I would passionately recommend looking at that option. Unfortunately, it's only available on Windows, so I can't show it working today, um, but it really is very good and actually provides support for a few more barcode types than, than the open source ones do. Even the commercial one is, is not that fast. It makes it quite a boring demo. So what I'm going to do at this point is close this one down and actually no I'm lying I won't close that one down I'll bring that one back up um, okay so I think I'll move on now to the to the cookie cutter so I'll resegment this image and the cookie cutter is something that we realized perhaps rather late in the day was going to be very useful for cases like this where we always have a template with our objects laid out in a regular grid. We've always got 100 slides. They're always pretty much in the same location. It's doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to ask Intellect to, to, to segment uh, from scratch every single time. So at the top here, next to the zoom in and zoom out buttons, we've got a cookie cutter drop down. So now that I've got my 100 boxes laid out in, in the right places, I click on that and I say save boxes to new cookie cutter and it prompts me for a name so I call this one 100 slides and from now on whenever I create a new inselect file uh, inselect will apply that cookie cutter so we will get those 100 boxes in exactly these locations 
So let's show that by dragging in another one of these slides images. Okay, so Intellect comes back once it's created the thumbnail, and there we have our 100 boxes all shaded in our lurid pink waiting for, for metadata. Right, so let's, just for the sake of argument, tag all these with the same catalogue number, same taxonomy, same location, just to get rid of the pink shading. One, uh, the last view of the document that I haven't shown yet is the objects view. So boxes is great for like, positioning the bounding boxes. Objects, we here now see all the boxes on a grid. Um, I can sweep with the mouse to do a multiple selection. I can use the up and down arrows together with holding down shift. I can apply some rotation. So if all of our slides are upside down and we want to do some label transcription, I can do control R for Romeo to go right, L for Lima to go left. Um, whatever rotation I apply here will be applied to the crops when they're exported. I can also double click on one of these to blow it up to full size and this makes the transcription much, much easier. Okay, so what I will do now is just show um, some command line tools. This is the last of the demos, and this is a bit dry. It doesn't even involve looking at any, at any pictures. So what's quite common in these operations, we found, is that we'll do all of the scanning in one go and build up a week's worth of, uh, in our case, sat scan images, each of which has got 100 slides on it. We don't really want to sit there dragging and dropping files and opening and closing documents and pressing buttons. We want to automate this as much as possible. So we've created command line tools to do this for us. This is kind of a typical workflow. Everything that you see shaded in blue, we offer a command line tool to do just that one job. Um, and these relate pretty much to the, the operations that I've been showing you in Intellect. So ingest is the act of creating the thumbnail file and the, the dot intellect file, possibly applying a cookie cutter at that stage. You might want to segment if you're not doing a cookie cutter operation. You probably want to open it up in Intellect to have a look unless you're very, very confident about the locations of all your objects. Reading barcodes, saving crops, and exporting metadata to a CSV. Again, we can. there's, there's a, a tool to handle each one of those jobs. So I won't go through all of this workflow, but I'll just show the ingest step in action. So here I have a folder of five TIFFs, and I'm going to ingest each of these and apply the 100 slides cookie cutter. Apologies for this, this horrible, uh, bland black screen. <laughs> um, if you're used to working at the command line, uh, by all means, ask questions about this, or, or perhaps look at the, the, some of the documentation for these tools. We're happy to help you get set up with them. Um, I'll hit return, and for each one of those TIFFs, Inselect's going to tell me that it started ingesting it and that it's finished ingesting it. So it's done the first file, and there we see the thumbnail and the dot .inselect. And it's going to go through each one of those TIFFs in turn. And that block of nastiness ending in inselect error, this TIFF could not be read as an image, is telling me that there was a problem with that one file and it's not been able to process it. And in actual fact, what I did is create a TIFF of zero bytes just in order to force an error from inselect, just to demonstrate the fact that if you've got a folder, in this case we only had five images, if you had several hundred and you kick this off on a Friday evening, you don't want to get back on Monday morning and find that it failed on the second image and then did nothing else. It's very, very robust and it, it works hard on each file and treats each file as its own operation. So um, that's pretty much the end of the, of the demo. Uh, I'd like to, I uh, was quite keen to keep it short so we had time for questions. Um, before finishing, I will briefly show where Inselect is hosted. So there's a, a website called GitHub, which is a, a truly dreadful name, but is kind of a, a standard repository for open source software of this type. Um, the only two important bits for an end user, I think, on this site are firstly the releases button, which is here. 
we tend to release the software relatively frequently. Um, uh, the last month or so, we've done at least one a week, I think. We, we follow an agile, an agile methodology where we release as, as often as possible, where each release just has, has a few incremental changes, new features, new bug fixes. This is good because we avoid a big bang where 101 things change in one go and all your nice functionality that you liked has disappeared and I've introduced a whole load of new bugs. Um, and also it gives you a chance to, to comment on, on new features as they trickle in so we can refine things very, very quickly. We're not going to dictate too much how these things work. We want to really want to engage with people and, and make the software to be as, as widely applicable and as useful as possible. So the last release um, fixed three problems. We can click on one of these and this takes us through to the issue that was raised. So in this case, I wanted a better object labels on the object view. Um, the set of issues is uh, free to be reviewed and contributed to. So if you've got ideas for, for features, um, if you spot a bug, please do report it there. We'll see it and we'll act upon it as soon as we can. Best thing to do if you're interested in trying Intellect um, in terms of which release to use is always the one at the top, the most recent release. So that's pretty much it from me. Um, thanks very much for watching. I really hope it's been useful. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Lawrence, for that uh, overview and for the demo. That was great. And I do see um, there's a questions going on. So if you guys have a second, look through the chat now, and we'll go into uh, – there we go. Now you can see more of the chat at once uh, – and go through the questions. Right, I'm just trying to get back to, <laughs> to where the questions start. Uh, exactly, take Ed, a minute. Do you, want to, do you want me to turn microphones on? Yes, please. So, okay, there's a question from Robin about, I think the first one I can see that's unanswered is about automatically assigning catalog numbers. Um, Kind of, yes. Um, in terms of something that's unique within the document, yes. Uh, so let me go back to that, this first template that I showed. There's a, value, there's a, um, a field value there called item number, which we can, um, which uh, Intellect guarantees is unique within that document. Um, in terms of something that's unique among documents, today, no, but we could certainly look at that. Actually, so, shall, I, shall I just share? Yeah, share if you want to show, Lawrence. Just, yeah, I will go back to sharing. Hold on. There you go. I'm sorry. No, no it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I had to be reminded that no one else can see my screen. <laughs> right. So apologies for that. So, yes, this is the first um, intellect template that we looked at. So the item number there that I've highlighted is, is, is guaranteed to be unique within the document. We could perhaps add a field in there that was something like, document name, um, and then the combination of document name and item number would sort of be a halfway house to getting to something that's a globally unique catalogue number, but in the strictest sense of the term, no, Intellect doesn't, doesn't really provide that. So there was a question early uh, from Christine Johnson and Lawrence, do you want to talk about that briefly, if or explain it? And you might have to click your microphone at the top to connect your audio. Those of you who have your mics are on now, but you might have to go to the top and click your mic icon to turn your microphone on. So you guys see and that. Uh, Chris had a question about the segmentation, um, and she's having a different experience. So I know that that's something, well, until they get their sound worked out, that um, yeah. in select, you guys are interested in seeing those examples, right? So you can... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Lawrence Hudson's Adobe Connect crash, so he's just uh -huh. reconnecting to the room. Yeah, uh, I see but that. Yeah. It would be interesting, I see Lawrence Livermore from our museums put a link to Dropbox with some of the examples. I haven't actually had a look at it yet. Um, but yeah, maybe it should just be a contrast issue. 
Um, yeah, I see. Okay, so I, I'm looking at it now. There's, it's it's a very pale background, and then the, the individual slides uh, don't have any sort of sockets that they're sitting in. Uh, so that's probably the reason there's um, an issue segmenting that image. Uh, however, if you lay them out in a, in a nice standard way like that, and then you use the cookie cutter, even if there's sort of drift between individual images, the slides are in slightly different positions, you can select all of them and then shift the boxes down to the appropriate place quite quickly. So we found that quite um, quite useful with our slide project. Um, but going forward, I'd recommend uh, creating a little template to put your slides into that's got a black back, uh, black sockets and a, a white background. Um, can you hear me? It's Chris. Yes, we hear you perfectly. OK. Um, actually, we did try the black background and everything. And part of the problem was that like in that first example you gave with the uh, label at the corner, it picked up all the, it's not that it's not picking up the edges of the slide. The issue is picking up all the corners of all the text and the labels in the slide itself. And then Lauren said that maybe using the cookie cutter where we're just getting um, the box around the slide will solve this issue. But that, that's the problem is that we had to get rid of all these extra boxes because it was picking up all the text as um, a box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, one of the things, of the things we're looking at is, is Lawrence living with a minimum, minimum, minimum size. And the other, and the other thing, thing is recently uh, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence has, once he's got his screen back, back up, he'll, he'll show you the um, um, select, select by size, size function. function. So, so you can actually select, select all the small ones, ones quite quickly and then just delete them. And then, and then it'll be all the, all the large slides. Slide slide. Yep. Yep. Hello. Deb, would it Deb, be possible to put Lawrence, Lawrence back, back, back as a presenter? As a presenter. You got the wrong, you got Lawrence. The wrong Lawrence. Yes. Uh, ben, Chris. I think in this case, like, uh, you can use that size selector. That is something that uh, Lawrence didn't, didn't dem demonstrate, but there is there is an option in in select. Yes. yes. Should I? So am I, am I back? Can, can you hear me now? Excellent. Um, yeah, Deb. Can I just share my screen again briefly? Talking and you mute your mic, the echoes will go away for everyone. Okay, so yes, um, okay, so yes, if, um, so apologies for that. Yeah, my my uh, my client crashed, so I, I disappeared for a bit. Um, as Vlad said, we've got a, a slider at the top right here, select by size, and this is it's kind of a blunt instrument, really. It's it's not a particularly elegant solution to the problem, but um, as I drag it more to the right. You can start to see it's selecting increasingly larger boxes, starting with the smallest one um, in terms of area. So the further I go to the right, you can start to see, I hope, bits of the of the image turn red as we're selecting more and more boxes. So if I just want to get rid of all the fiddly little ones where it's, it's picked up um, extraneous labels or text or what have you, you can you can drag to the right or drag to the left to start with the biggest box and then select increasingly smaller ones the further to the left you get. And there is a keyboard shortcut for both of those operations. So I'm now using the keyboard to go to the left and to the right. So both that solution and, if honest, I think the cookie cutter, they're fairly blunt instruments. They're not really particularly sophisticated. We, but, but they do help. They definitely make things faster. We want to get to, to the stage of having much better segmentation algorithms. So Stefan and Peter, I think, did a wonderful job of, of the algorithm as it stands. But it's, it's one that kind of works pretty well, we found, across a diversity of, of image types. It's certainly got a lot of free parameters that, again, we just, we just nailed down to work reasonably well. So we just need a bit of time, really, to, to dig into that algorithm a bit more, see what more we can get out of it, and then also to engage with more computer vision people to, to develop more sophisticated algorithms. But we, we would love to hear experiences, good and bad, of, of how the segmentation is performing and to build up a library of um, of images against which we can test future developments. Cool. Uh, Heather, so, Heather, I, I know whoever changed the chat size changed it for everybody. So if you want to change it back, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. It's, that's how that's how you learn how how this works. I, I, I found my little, little control panel now, so I'm going to stop showing my screen. 
Um, Heather, I see you had a, a question where you were saying that in, in the objects view, we can select um, individuals, but you wanted to see that in the boxes view that we could actually bulk select and bulk annotate. Yeah. Um, if you've got a draw where you've got multiple species in one draw. Yeah. Is that worth showing as an example? Do people, would people like to see that? I would think yes. So. Okay. Right. I will find an example, if I can, of the sort of thing we're talking about. Okay, so this is an example of uh, Ephemeroptera mayflies, and as you can see, we've got um, a handful of different trays inside the same drawer. So I think the question was about tagging just a subset of all the boxes within the image. So Control A for alpha selects all. Control D for delta selects none, and that's kind of standard uh, shortcuts across all operating systems. I can just do a left click, drag with the mouse to select just that one tray. Um, and then tag metadata um, with whatever we want to put in. Similarly, drag and drop, sorry, drag a box round this tray at the bottom right, tag that with some different meta metadata. So, yes, yeah, that's, that's a reasonably straightforward operation, but it's not, uh, not automated in any way. Um, ben, I, we had that little private chat in the back. Do you think you could, I, I had asked Ben if maybe he might import, um, oops, somebody increased the oh, size of the chat again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you could um, import Chris's image uh, from the Dropbox. And yep. yeah, yay, there we go. So here's the problem, right? Yeah, oh. That's not particularly great. Yeah, no, so that's, that's not so good at all. <laughs> you can see it has a little size. Well, apart from, from two, two, I think, or three. three. Uh, but yeah, yeah the, all, the, all the label, label images have been pulled out, too. Uh, uh, I, suppose I suppose this one you could go with the select, select by, by size. size. You quite, quite quickly, quickly you'd be, be able, able to, to get rid of all the big ones, oh, all the small ones, sorry. I can just delete those, and that's cleaning it up quite a bit. Yes, that's almost at the stage, then, of it's being quicker to, to draw boxes yourself rather than use the automatic method and then tidy it up. Um, yeah, that's a good example for, for me to, to use as a reference for how to improve this algorithm. So if we review the bidding here for a second, um, going back. So Chris, did that help you? What do you think? You got to unmute, Chris. Your mic's muted. <laughs> Chris Johnson. <laughs> was it? That was great that we could look at your, your image straight up there and see, see the issue. And we can't hear you, Chris. Sorry, I, I missed the question. <laughs> oh, I was just saying, was that helpful to see your image in action there and what they did so you yeah, can... It was, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I have to update, I think, the version that we're using and um, it is helpful. And to everyone who doesn't use this, it's a great, it is a great tool. I really Oh, fantastic. That's great to hear. Thanks very much. We're thrilled to know that it's, it's uh, being used outside of the museum here and uh, that it's proving to be useful. Um, I so have a I question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I can't see any more unanswered questions, but um, if you have a question, Deb, please go ahead. So I had a question when you showed the Darwin Core fields that people, and you were saying we can't assign it automatically, but if somebody has, you know, something like a UUID or something, whatever, how are they going to get it into that box? So that's where it's got to kind of be on the barcode so it can be automatically read? I mean... 
um, into a... I think for the, for the machine to do it, we're by far and away the, the, the most efficient way is, is, is by a barcode. I, I mean, I, naively, not being a curator, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be told I'm wrong in this, but I, I would hope that if something's got a, a unique identifier, that that is the one identifier that's on a barcode that's stuck onto the object. Um, I realize I might be hopelessly out of band by saying that. Um, that's certainly the easiest way. Uh, Inselect's read barcode function always places the values of the barcode in the catalog number field. Um, so if there are multiple barcodes, you will get multiple values in that one same field. We've not come across a situation in-house where we've had, we've had that requirement to split different barcodes into different fields. That's something we could certainly look at, but it would, would I think, be, be quite a challenge to, to implement it technically. Something like OCR for reading labels is something we've talked about, but the, that's a, a bigger deal. That's not something we're, we're really considering at the moment. Well, something I did notice, though, uh, that you could go back and, and address is when there was a label in the drawer, the image segmentation software did a really great job of putting a bounding box around the text. That is incredibly useful. So then you could point the OCR at that section and it knows that each inside each of those boxes is actual text it should try to work on. Um, yes. So the fact that it can find that and bound them is is useful. Um, yes, that's certainly a possibility. Um, there are lots of different options for these things and different ways of doing things. So there's the, the sort of analogous to the cookie cutter. We could have a situation where we could automate reading of things. Um, in addition to catalog number, we could automate, say, uh, location and taxonomy. Y you, you could imagine that if all your hundred slides were in the same genus and all in the same drawer, you might just place a couple of barcodes down in predefined sockets saying, well, this is the, the barcode that says it's this genus, and this is the barcode that says it's draw number 108. And then Intellect would know to always look in those places and to always identify the values of those field, of, the, of those barcodes with particular fields. Um, so there, I mean, there are lots of things we talk about, lots of ways we, we thought that we could automate this further. It's really just a question of time to investigate the options in more detail and then to also actually do the work. So OCR hasn't really been a thing for us until now, but um, it's certainly something we can look at. So I see there are some other questions here, and you guys keep piping up. Um, could this be used to reunite two-sided data cards? And I wondered if there were also slides with two sides, uh, what you guys do in that case. Yes. So definitely. two questions. Um, yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Brilliant. So uh, we had this um, issue in the uh, Microscope Slide project where you have slides which are double have labels on both sides. And um, so what uh, Lawrence Hudson developed for then for, for that part of the project, which is what would be applicable to uh, double-sided uh, card index collections, is that if you place the index cards in the same um, sort of template image them, then flip them over and image them again. You can create an initial inselect document which segments out uh, the top side of the cards and then say copy to a new document where inselect will ask you to pick the, the high resolution image and it will then copy all of the metadata that you've um, annotated those fronts of the index cards to the reverse sides of the images and then you'll be able to associate the front and back of each of those index cards. Does that help with that question? We could show that in action. It helps me. I, yeah, I can't speak for Jean, um, who's still with us. So hopefully Jean, Jean is typing. Yay. Or you can speak, Jean. So if you want a dem uh, demonstration of that, Lawrence could show you his screen again. Okay, so let me just get up. Um, I'm going to fudge an example now using slides. Uh, where are we? Let's get this one up. So let's say for the sake of argument that I'd tagged up all of the boxes with the correct metadata. Uh, let me load the template back. So in this case, it's the same metadata stupidly applied to each of the each of the boxes, but uh, if we've got a situation where we've actually got exactly the right metadata in here, we've, we've done the read barcodes operation. Under the file man menu, 
there's a, an option copy to new document. So what this will do is prompt you for a an image file. And before I do that, I'll have to delete the existing in select document. So just one second, apologies for this. File, copy to new document. It asks me for an image. So I pick another image, and this is on the same slides template, 100 objects in the same arrangement. As before, it creates the thumbnail. And it hasn't applied a cookie cutter in this place. It's actually copied the bounding boxes and all of the metadata from the previous document. That's why they all now appear clear. So if I click on this first box, we've got the value of catalog number, location, and taxonomy as copied from the previous image that we looked at. So as Ben said, this lets us handle the case where we've got double-sided slides. You put them all in up, uh, face up, and then you put them face down, but in the same socket. That's very important. And then InSelect lets you um, lets you copy across the, met the metadata in that in that way. So again, it's it's relatively crude, but it sort of works quite well for those cases where it comes up. That's very cool. Um, so Jean did reply, you guys. I know you're having a chance to keep up with the chat there. Um, that that was very helpful. Um, the example that we gave, and then this one. I love that. That's the fact that you can flip it over effectively and get, get both sides. That's really cool. Uh, other other questions here? You guys have a few, just a few minutes, one minute kind of left here. <laughs> Nicole asked some questions here. I see Lawrence has been piping in to ask about uh, the machine learning aspect of how it knows where to segment two wings versus four wings or the shape. Um, and I had a related question. When you use the sub-segment box, is that information being used to inform the algorithms? In other words, does it learn from when you say, hey, you, you thought this was one thing, but it's two? Um, does it learn from that? That's a very good question. Uh, the short answer is no, it doesn't. The, 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 the big segment, so the major segment algorithm and the sub-segment are slightly different. Um, so I could um, I could demonstrate that if that's if that's of interest to see how that works. It it doesn't learn. Um, let's bring up this uh, this box again of the insect soups. So let's go in here. Are we? Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Okay. So I'm back to this scenario. We've got one bounding box around two individuals. Shift click on the center of each. Subsegment, and it's created a bounding box around each one. There's a, a little, well, it's, I don't know if I call it a feature, a thing, where we can see how the subsegment algorithm worked out which one was which. So when I clicked on each one and pressed subsegment, Intellect is treating the, the image within that bounding box, the original big bounding box, as a topographical surface. And it's starting to fill up valleys with different colored water. So the lighter green at the top and the, and, the, and the blue at the bottom. And it doesn't let the, the two colored water, different colors of water interact, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, it's kind of a recognized computer vision technique. It's relatively straightforward. It's, it's, it's well understood, which is good. It's quite quick to run, but it's nothing particularly fancy. All right, everyone, I think we're just about out of time. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anybody's questions that we missed. I don't think so now. Um, and everybody here can see in the chat how to contact the, the developers. And please, take a minute before you leave. Please, don't anybody go anywhere yet. And share your feedback. Um, we, we really need that, and InSelect needs that. So all these ideas that you jotted down while we were watching, um, Please click on that link and give the developers uh, your feedback and your insights into what would make this tool useful for you, no matter what you want to take pictures of and capture data from. 
because it doesn't have to be in sex in drawers. What else have you guys used this for besides that and slides? Uh, we've used it, okay, we've used it for insects and drawers, we've used it for slides, um, for counting the number of specimens in a sticky trap. Uh, we're looking into the whole insect soup at the moment and a sort of automated classification with um, obviously some additional downstream computer vision uh, for sort of ecological studies. Um, and we're also looking in uh, in the sponge store. There are drawers of dry sponges that will be um, appropriate for using the sort of um, batch annotation. Yeah. And Deb, this is Talia. All one more um, possible application. I've played around with this a little bit for fossil specimens in trays. So our drawers are laid out with tons of tiny boxes all tetris nicely together. And so um, Gil Nelson had me try this out on our fossil specimens, and it worked really well. Oh, oh fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, I have plans to do more, so I will probably be in touch with you guys. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah, if there's anything that doesn't work, let us know. Sure, we'll do. So again, for those of you who are too shy to speak up here or have some ideas, make sure you click on that survey link because that's what's going to get the developers who are hard at work right now adding new features to this software for you. Um, they, they need to hear uh, about your, your creative ideas. Uh, there were another question that popped in right here at the end about uh, Rita Aurora, who just joined us. Um, about batch processing uh, of the image segmentation. And so maybe, Rita, you could watch the um, recording and you can contact um, the developers to ask more questions. Oh, and Definitely, somebody, yes, Nicole, so writes that she's, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the batch processing, it does involve getting your hands a little bit dirty on the command line, but um, we're, we're very, we're very, uh, we're very happy to help out to get you started. And I see Nicole says she's used it for lizards from pitfall traps as well. Uh, so I, I think there's probably some, some new ideas will come out of this for, for potential uses. And I'd like to thank uh, you, Ben and Lawrence, both for your time to put this together and to sit here through and work through all this with us. It's, I've had a great time. I hope everybody else has too. Um, very much looking forward to everybody's feedback, and thank you very much. No, thank you, Deb, for organizing the webinar. Sure. Definitely, yeah. Thanks very much for having us. You're welcome. And as soon as we're all done here, uh, I'll be uh, and it will go up on the IDIG bio webpage, uh, and it'll also go up on Vimeo. I can ask uh, Kevin to render that for us to put it put it up there, or we'll put a link. Thanks, everybody. Brilliant.